Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat number 111, featuring the first part of my interview with the independent game designer Jonas Kiratzis. Now we like to complain all the time here at Match Hat about how uh, the modern game scene is too repetitive, is too similar, there's not enough originality. Uh, Jonas is definitely a solid alternative and somebody we should be paying careful attention to. He's absolutely a brilliant game designer. He's responsible for lots of games, including uh, Phenomenon 32, uh, Museum of Broken Memories, Alpha Land, and lots more. And plus he's got all kinds of projects that he's currently working on that we talk about in this video. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jonas Kiratzis. Hi folks, I am here with Jonas Kiratzis. He is the designer of Infinite Ocean, Alpha Land, and a lot of other really highly innovative, original, uh, politically relevant games. It's an honor to get to talk to you. How are you doing, Jonas? Fine, fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, now you've got a lot of projects going on. I was reading on your blog. You got a lot of a lot of stuff going on, uh, screenplays, a, a game about trolls, communists, <laughs> communist space, <laughs> communist space cats of Venus, the Book of Living Magic. Uh, you're a really busy guy. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what, what, which one of these projects is, has you most excited, Red? Um, that's really difficult to answer. One reason, uh, actually, is that I I saw. I love working on, on all these various things, so I just do all the things that really excite me. So in a sense, they all excite me in very different ways. I think if there's, any, if there's one reason that maybe my games are so, so different um, from each other uh, and from other games is that I really hate being bored and I really hate boring projects and I really hate repeating myself. That's one thing that you can, I think, notice. Even though a lot of my games have common themes, I really hate repeating myself. I really, really do. So um, all of these are very exciting in different ways, and I know that's a weird and not very useful answer, but it's true. Well, tell me about this, uh, the troll game. Now, as, as I understand, this is, instead of uh, trolls being the bad guys, they're going to be uh, the good guys, and they're also going to be gay guys. So <laughs> how do you think that's yes. going to play out? Well, uh, the plan is for it to be a, a large game, a downloadable commercial game, not a, a flash game, because I want it to be a really, really big adventure story. But at the center of it is a love story of these two trolls going on a journey together. And yeah, they happen to both be male. Um, how people are going to react to that, I really don't know. I didn't make the game or I didn't come up with the idea to say, ooh, I'm going to cash in on that, you know, that big gay people market or something. It's just, it just came to me like that and I thought, hey, why not? Besides, who's telling, you know, real stories about gay people? Because, you know, someone ought to. I mean, I don't know how many gay gamers there are out there, but I mean, there's got to be a market uh, for a game like that, I would think. I I hope so. I, I would hope so. I would hope actually that that it doesn't matter. It's just it's a love story, and that's you know a love story and an adventure story. And I think that that's something that everyone should be able to to like. What about communist space cats of Venus? <laughs> it's got a, that's a great name for a game if I've ever I've ever heard one. So, uh, what's this game going to be about? Um, it's a Metroidvania game, or rather a Catroidvania game uh, for Flash, um, in which the, uh, how did I say, how did I write it, the nap-loving uh, communist space cats of Venus have been invaded by the capitalist dogs of Uranus. Um, yes, very low, very stupid jokes. Um, and you help, basically you're one of the cats and you start a revolution. Uh, a lot of cat humor, some political humor as well. Um, it's just fun. I, for some reason, I particularly just enjoy working on something and having this little cat walk around and jump. And I, I guess I have a cat thing going anyway. So um, fun little thing. Everybody we'll loves see. cats. Come on. Okay, then we I have so. uh, the book of the book of living magic. Now, can you tell, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's um, an adventure game, point-and-click adventure game. Um, similar to one of my older games, um, The Strange and Somewhat Sinister Tale of the House at Desert Bridge, particularly notable for having an incredibly long title. Um, um, it's very humorous, but hopefully also has heart. 
Um, it's finished. It's looking for a sponsor. Um, and it's the story of a young girl who runs away from home to find the Book of Living Magic, which she saw in a dream. And so on top and, of all this, you've got a, a project that you're working on with Terry uh, Kavanaugh, who's mm -hmm. you know, famous for his VVVV <laughs> v game, which I, I love that game. Uh, so uh, next, uh, a prequel to Nexus City. So what, what is this project? Well, um, Nexus City and its prequel are uh, two games set in this, this world that we've come up with, which is an alternate history Arizona, but really alternate history. Uh, like, I tend to think of it as, imagine if someone basically took peyote and then wrote a Super Nintendo sort of RPG. Um, it's quite wacky, uh, hopefully at times very funny, maybe serious as well. Uh, very much inspired by those old RPGs, um, but in a setting that I think no one's really done before. Uh, partially coming out of my interest in various themes relating to uh, the Southwest and history, American history. But it also has these crazy influences from Egypt. It's a very, very alternate history, but uh, it's great fun. That sounds really fascinating. Now, you're also playing uh, this game. This, uh, I saw this on Steam earlier today. Ter Terraria? <laughs> I think I Terraria. Put, Terraria. I, I need to get a pronunciation guide for these. Uh, so what, what do you think is so great about this game? Oh, um, it appeals to some of my most profound sort of instincts of building and exploration. Um, you know, having these, these large, randomly generated worlds, building things in them, exploring, digging. A lot of people have compared it to Minecraft, which I haven't played as much. Um, I think it's a bit more game-like than Minecraft. Uh, it's sort of more clearly structured. It has bosses that you need to find and destroy and certain things which always pop up in the world. But, you know, it's not, um, it's not the sort of game with a deep storyline or anything. But nevertheless, it appeals to some of the the better instincts in us, I think, you know, not going and killing or defeating or this, but finding and building and making. And I just love it. I'm completely addicted to it. My wife and I just sit there and play all day. Well, that's not true. We work all day and then we play a little, but it's a lovely game. I'm really happy it's, it's successful. And I feel that the developers are, are doing a really good job of improving it, of, of really taking it seriously, taking their work seriously. I, I really like that. Now, Jonas, you've done a lot of work with screenplays as well, and I, was, I wanted to get your uh, feedback on this question. So what is it, how would you compare uh, writing a screenplay to designing a game? Mm, it's, well, it's not the same, but parts of it are the same, I think. I, I've been experimenting uh, with writing the script for Nexus City actually using Final Draft, which is what I'm also using for the screenplays, uh, where it becomes difficult is um, when stuff branches. That's, that's the, the main difference, of course, interactivity. Um, and there are certain things, I think, that in, in game design, even in game writing, that, that you don't really do in a f when you write a film. Films are sort of more focused around a, a very specific structure, and, and games include all these various elements. Um, so it very much depends on, on what kind of game you're making. It's a very different experience. Like if I tried to write a script for Alpha Land, what the hell would that be? Uh, like, you know, five lines or, or what? Um, so it, it, really, it really depends on the, the game you're making. I'm certainly seeing a lot of parallels uh, between writing stuff for Nexus City and writing a regular screenplay, partially also because I'm not the designer on Nexus City, which means that... All I'm really doing is providing dialogue and, and certain structural elements, and the rest is done by, by Terry, by the designer. Um, but I very much believe in approaching every project in its own way. So not every screenplay is the same either, if you do it right, I think. <laughs> yeah, it seems like the movie industry is, is suffering from the same sequelitis and remakes and all this stuff. Oh, it? God, yeah. <laughs> yeah speaking of... You know, Lee, as I guess that's a good lead into this question from a, a fan named Christopher Copeland. This is a great question. So he, he asks you, uh, do you believe that games can, can carry 
a deeper message to the people playing them, or will games be forever confined to only entertainment? Well, I think I have to question the basic premise of it because I don't see a difference between, shall we say, message and the art itself or politics and, and, and the medium itself. Uh, I think if you try to sort of tack on a message to a game, if you kind of separate the story, the, the, the thing itself, uh, the work, from the message, you're going to fail. You're, you're going to come up with a message game or a message movie, you know, these sort of after-school special type things that, that are just dreadful. Um, I think it has to be part of, of, of what you're making at a deeper level, and I think it always is. I think art cannot escape having some sort of message or, or some sort of other content. It's Okay, yes, Tetris doesn't have one, but I think anything that's essentially a narrative, anything that, that has a world or a story will have it. And I think some, that's something that we aren't necessarily aware of. Sometimes we just replicate certain things, you know, whoa, we're the butch soldiers and we're going to kill us some bad guys. And we don't even think about it. We're just saying, oh, I'm just making a game, you know. But there is still actually something that you're saying, whether you like it or not. Same goes for action movies, for example, you know. I mean, it, it may be great fun, but you've just, you know, mown down 300 people. And, uh, well, you are still saying something about life. So no matter what a game designer says, there's always some ideology uh, behind the game. Well, I think... I mean, art is speaking in public. You're always, just like politics, you're speaking in public to entertain. Yes, I, I'm not denying that aspect at all. But the way you're doing it is still you're telling a story. And every story has, you know, some way of interacting with the world in which it is told with its context. I, I, what I always say is you, you, you cannot exist outside of context. So, um our games exist in context. As for whether or not they can ever be more than entertainment, first of all, I don't like this division between art and entertainment very much. Uh, I, I like my art to be entertaining, even if it entertains me in a strange way, like making me cry. Um, but I still enjoy it on some level. Um, but I think they already are. They, they've always been. They've always been art. Games... I don't think they have to reach to become art. I think just they just are by the very nature of what they are. Whether they're good art is a different question. Yeah, a lot of people I've talked to, they're, uh, you know, they, they talk about how the, as a designer, they have all these brilliant ideas they want to pursue, but the uh, sort of the mainstream industry, the publishers are just really only concerned with, the, I guess, what you'd call lowest common denominator fare, right? This catering to the mass. They don't want to challenge anybody. They... Um, I mean, but your games really seem different to that. So I was wondering, what kind of resistance have you faced uh, from, from mainstream or, or more uh, typical uh, designers and publishers or, or sponsors? Yeah, um, it's been difficult. To, now that I've sort of transitioned to trying to sell my games, to find sponsorships for them, it's not been that easy. Um, Finding players is not a problem. There are players, for the most part, who want to play these games, who enjoy these games, who get something out of them. Quite a few. Sometimes I'm surprised by how many. But um, the problem is, of course, that there's still one or one middleman or multiple middlemen in a way. There's the portals on the one hand and uh, sponsors, uh, which is generally the same depending on your situation. But um, so... Yeah, it's difficult, and and it's difficult because you got still got to make a living somehow. You still have to survive from day to day, and the thing is, game development takes quite a bit of time. So if you go and say, "Oh, you know what? I'll have a day job and I'll make games on the side," you're not going to make a lot of games. Have you been able to make a living doing uh, doing your games? Um, just barely. Just barely. We're scraping by from paycheck to paycheck at this point. Uh, and the paychecks are getting smaller, um, certainly. Uh, it's, it's getting harder, I feel, in general. To I, I think there was this, this sort of upsurge at one point when Flash games started becoming really big. And suddenly there were a few really successful sort of art games, as people... I don't like the term, but, but you know. And, and then... For a while, I think sponsors were quite willing to pay for these weird little things that, that people make that 
are brilliant, some of them. But I think that's kind of going away now, and I think it's it's moving more towards make stuff that will go viral, make stuff that follows certain patterns, and everything else. You can get a little bit of money, but not the kind of money that you can live off of. All right, you hear that, guys? So I want everybody to go out and, <laughs> and buy buy all of Jonas's games right now, because he's fighting nope, nice. fighting the good fight here. Uh, speaking of fighting, uh, I was. I notice a lot of your games have similar themes, or they're you know they share a lot of themes. So one of them is war, uh, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if uh, you know there's so many mainstream games that are also concerned with war. And I was wondering if you are bothered by the way uh, war is portrayed in games like the the Call of Duty series and, and Medal of Honor and so on and so forth. That's a. I don't want to answer that in too simplistic a way. I fully understand that there is. There's space, I think, for, for just just games that are just purely about gameplay where, where some of the, you know, these, these uh, narrative trappings are really just there to give it a bit of flavor. I don't think that everyone who plays a war game, I've played Battlefield at some point as well in the far past and enjoyed it, as a matter of fact, as a purely multiplayer experience. And I can't deny that there is enjoyment to be had there but on the other hand I also have to question you know these narratives that we keep repeating these these uh, notions especially in the context of this really happening I mean there are wars being fought at this very moment and I do think it desensitizes us to to that you know I mean it's not a coincidence that video games get used to train people to to make the act of killing into a, a game. I don't buy the other argument that if you play games, you're going to start you know, going out with an Uzi and, and killing everyone in your way. That's insane. But in video games as well as in movies, you know, killing and, and war have become or have always been perhaps you know, this sort of macho thing of being cool and, and doing the right thing by just killing some guy who happens to have different skin color. And I do think that we at, ne at least need to be aware of this. Um, and I'm, obviously my game's going in, in the opposite direction and, and try to, uh, to say something different. I don't want to condemn everyone who plays you know, Call of Duty and say, you are a fascist. But be careful when you play them because there are some things that you're being told that, that may not be true. Uh, and and I, I do think of these things in context. That's that's it. I think. Yeah, that seems like a a, sophis a very sophisticated view compared to a lot of uh, the of the more mainstream guys that I've I've talked to, or the big the, you know the big developers working for these big publishers. Because you know, uh, when you ask them about video game violence, for instance, uh, they they seem like they want to have it both ways, right? They'll say, well, um, yes, games can make you a better person. Games can make you more productive, and, and so on. Uh, but then you say, well, can games make you more violent? Oh, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Uh, so I always thought that was sort of a weird that they think that they only want to take the positive and, and not the not even consider that the, the games can have a negative influence. Yeah, and it kind of also denies the power of the, the medium, doesn't it? Because, well, art influences us. That's the whole point you know it, it it influences us powerfully and it can do this in a good way and in a bad way and if we're not aware of that then we're sort of um not able to take responsibility for the power of of the medium and that's all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that should be back next week with another slice of this interview with mr jonas karatsis haven't even begun to scratch the surface we still got to talk about all of his uh, individual games and the stories and philosophies behind them so stay tuned lots of great stuff coming up and as always i want to thank everyone who has been supporting matt chat and supporting me it really means a lot to me i greatly appreciate that helping to keep these interviews coming, not just the history of gaming, but the future alive and well. So thanks to everyone who has supported the show. And as always, I want to end with a quotation, this time from one of Jonas's favorite poets, Mr. William Blake. And it goes something like this, Always be ready to speak your mind, and a base man will avoid you. <laughs> See you guys next week.
victory.